we're walking uh, through the life of Jesus according to the gospel of Mark. And this is the journey that we're on. And um, there's good things and bad things about teaching through a, a book like uh, a book of the Bible, like Mark. Uh, is it takes a while. I don't know if anybody's noticed. But we're only in chapter 6. And we're not getting out of chapter 6 today. <laughs> so it's going to take a while. But uh, one of the good things about it is, is it forces you to deal with everything that's in there. And so you can't skip it. So you just you talk about the thing that's next. And, and so we're going to talk about the thing that's next. And so you can't blame me. Uh, it's just what happens next. And I'm going to, we're going to pick up in uh, Mark chapter 6 starting in verse 30. And um, sorry, I have to put my glasses on. Don't hold me to this. Um, by the time you get to the 11 o'clock service, I say stuff that sometimes I regret. Um, I don't know if I'm going to regret this one. I don't hold me this to this. But I tell you something I'm thinking through. Um, I'm thinking through maybe um, eliminating the scripture on the screens and saying, um, I need you to bring your Bible. Uh, so I'm thinking about that and praying about that. So we'll see where that goes. Um, uh, but today we're going to put it on the screen, at least some of it. And some of it, it's not going to be on the screen. So we're going to pick up in verse 30 of chapter 6. Now, at the beginning, towards the beginning of chapter 6, Jesus sent out his 12 apostles and he sent them out. And he, um, he sent them out two by two to do this ministry tour. And so in verse 30, we get the report. In verse 30, the apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all they had done and taught. And that's all we have. Isn't that disappointing? Because <laughs> I would really like to know what happened on this ministry tour. I would really like to know what they did, what happened, you know, what the experience, you know, who flubbed it, who knocked it out of the park. I mean, you know what, you know, what was it? But that's all we got. That's all we got. And so all God wants us to know about this ministry tour is they came back and they told Jesus what happened. In verse 31, then Jesus said, let's go off ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. If I could just sit with you a while. Because they're tired. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. And we've all had those days, right? You know the day you've been so busy you forgot to eat lunch. So they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. But many recognized them and saw them leaving. And people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them. And Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat. So Jesus had this retreat planned for his disciples to rest. And when they got there, everybody was there. And then Mark tells us that he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Sheep without a shepherd. In Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, this analogy of sheep and shepherd is very apparent. It's used a lot. When you think about a shepherd, and what I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to, to picture one in your mind. He, he needs to have a tan because he's in the sun a lot. His face probably needs to be weathered because being a shepherd is hard, hard work. I just want you to picture that shepherd. Picture how many sheep he has. Maybe he has 10, maybe he has 12, I don't know, maybe he has 50. Maybe he has 100. There's some things that we know about a shepherd. A shepherd has to be committed. He has a 24-7 Seven day a week job. The sheep don't go home for the weekend. So the shepherd has to be committed. A shepherd has to be adaptable. Because sometimes the shepherd goes to that secret pasture 
that he thinks none of the other shepherd knows about. And when he gets there, all of the grass is eaten. And now he's got to do something different. So a shepherd's got to be adaptable. A shepherd has to be approachable. Jesus talks about this. He says when, when the shepherd calls, when the shepherd speaks, the sheep know his name. And I was going out my uncle, my, uh, on my mom's side, I uh, had, a, had a farm. And I would go up and spend some time with him. And I can remember those days we'd get in the truck, the old beat-up truck, not the one you would drive around town in, but the farm truck. And we'd go out and we'd take the salt licks out to the pasture. Who knows what a salt lick is? Okay, so if you don't know, Google it. And we would take that along with some feed. And when you would get in that field and you start bumping down in that old truck, and then the cows just start, they just started coming out of everywhere. They came out of the woods, they came here and they start, and it'd be a little nervous the first time I did, because I remember they started chasing the truck, and I'm like, oh my goodness, what, you know, what's happening? And they knew, they knew the sound of that truck. They knew the sound of that feed hitting the feeder. They knew that what that salt look was going to be. So they were, that's, that's, there's that approachability. A shepherd knows connection. A shepherd knows connection. Jesus tells us the story of how there was 99 sheep. And the shepherd wasn't, wasn't secure with the 99. He knew there was one missing, so he left to go find the one because he knew a sheep by itself will face certain death. And so he goes and gets the one. So there's got to be connection. A shepherd has got to be wise. You can't let a sheep drink too much. You can't let a sheep eat too much. You can't, you can't do the walking in the heat of the day. He's got to be wise. He's got to be a learner. They tell us that sheep, each sheep has its own personality. And, and, and it's people who work with sheep know it's just like, oh, yeah, that one's this way, this one, this, this way. And if he's a learner, then obviously there's truth because all of these things are wrapped up in the truth of what it means to be a shepherd, what it means to have sheep and be in a flock. The scripture's filled with references to a sheep and a shepherd. And when Jesus gets out of the boat, and so he's, He's, he's trying to take his disciples to a place where there's no people. Now, this past week, our staff got to go on retreat. And we retreated up into the mountains at a cabin. And when we got there, none of you were there. It was glorious. I was like, yes, there is nobody here but us. <laughs> Jesus is trying to do this and... Um, it's not working out so well. And so he looks around and he says, or he thinks, or maybe he says, we don't know, Mark, at least Mark is saying, it was like they were like a sheep without a shepherd. Maybe the most famous passage of scripture that deals with shepherd is Psalms 23. It's written by King David. Before King David was King David, he was warrior David. And before he was warrior David, he was shepherd David. And so he writes, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows and he leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along the right paths, bringing honor to his name. So those are all good things. Green pastures and quiet waters. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, there are going to be dark valleys. It's just the way it is. He doesn't say, keep me from the dark valley. He's just saying, I know that when I'm in the dark valley, you are with me. So, I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. And when you pictured that shepherd in your mind, was he holding a staff? He should be. It's his only tool. And that staff that a shepherd would use, he'd use it to protect his sheep from animals. 
He would use it to, to lift them out when they would fall in a ditch or a ravine that they couldn't get out of. But his primary reason for the staff was as they were as he was leading them. Now remember, you lead sheep, you drive cattle. And when we confuse that, we're going to mess up. And the way he would lead is tap, tap. Keeping, keeping them on the path, keeping them away from the edge, keeping them from wandering off. Tap, tap. Now, occasionally, there's an adolescent sheep, male. <laughs> and the shepherd has to whack! <laughs> whack! Because he will not listen. Have you ever noticed that correction never feels like protection? Correction never feels like protection, but it is. He says, you prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies, so there's going to be enemies. An enemy-less life is not possible. You honor me by anointing my head with oil, my cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. You and I need a heavenly shepherd. And God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are our shepherd, our ultimate shepherd. But we also need a human shepherd. And this is the way that God has set it up. I need a shepherd. You need a shepherd. You need someone to guide you. You need someone to lead you. You need somebody to correct you. You need someone to fight for you. You need somebody to chase you when you're out there by yourself and you've gotten separated from the flock. This analogy is all through Scripture. And Peter, you know, brash Peter, know it all Peter, he writes a couple of epistles when he's later in life. And this is Peter with gray hair. And this is Peter who's been through some stuff. And he writes in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. And now a word to you who are elders in the church. He's writing to the shepherds. Not writing to the sheep. He's writing to the shepherds. Did I tell y'all that sheep are dumb? Did I say that a while ago? I didn't say that, did I? No, I talked about where the shepherd was. This is good. I got a funny joke. I got to use this. Okay, listen. So sheep are not very bright. They're just not very bright, okay? They are also incredibly fragile. Sheep are fragile. There is not, y'all ready? Here comes the joke. There is not a football team that has chosen sheep to be their mascot. <laughs> there is no such thing as fear the sheep. It just doesn't exist, right? Sheep are fragile. Without a shepherd, sheep die. They literally do not have enough sense to get out of the rain. And if their wool gets so wet, they will fall over and they can't get up. A lying sheep is easy dinner. So there's this analogy all through scripture. And Peter here is writing in 1 Peter chapter 5. He's writing to the shepherds. He says, and now a word to you who are elders in the church, churches. Because Peter's not writing to just one particular church or one particular person. He's writing to Christians in general. He says, I too am an elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ. And I too shall share in his glory when he is revealed to the whole world. I cannot wait for that day. As a fellow elder, I appeal to you. Care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. He's using this analogy of shepherd and sheep. Jesus gets out of the boat. He looks around at all the people. He has compassion because they are 
sheep without a shepherd. Care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly. Not for what you will get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God. Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead them by your own good example. And when the great shepherd... So now he's referring to God as the shepherd. Appears, you will receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. In the same way, you who are hunger must, hungry must accept the authority of the elders. To come under the elder and protection of a shepherd. And all of you, dress yourself in humility as you relate to one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. There is nowhere in the scripture, nowhere, where you will find that it's okay to be proud. God hates it. It's the humble that he's after. Unfortunately, most people in churches have a hard time being under the authority of the shepherd because there's been too many shepherds who have abused the position. But that does not change the fact that you need a shepherd. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God and at the right time he will lift you up in honor, give all of your worries and cares to God for he cares about you. You ever heard that verse? Cast all your cares on him. Yeah. Isn't it interesting that that verse is in the context of talking to Shepherds. Now, it applies to everyone. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Maybe a sheep on its side because it doesn't have enough sense to get out of the rain. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are in his kindness God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus so after you have suffered a little while he will restore support and strengthen you and he will place you on a firm foundation all power to him forever amen we need to understand that Jesus is our shepherd he is the great shepherd We also understand as humans, we need a human shepherd. And this is the way that God has set it up. Most of the world is completely unaware that they need a shepherd. I don't think anybody would argue with that. Most of the world is completely unaware that they need a shepherd. But I'm not talking to most of the world. I'm talking to you and you. This past Friday morning, I was on my run. I, um, I pulled out my phone and I wrote this down. So just understand I was running. So it's not real grammatically correct. Not that it would be that way if I wasn't running, but <laughs> here's what I wrote. You need a pastor. You get to choose who your pastor is. God allows you, gives you the freedom to do that. But you do not get to choose not to have a pastor. You get to choose who your pastor is. And once you choose one, walk with him. Unless he walks away from living and teaching the truth, then you be the first one to leave. But if he's walking and living in the truth... Walk with him. There will be times when he disappoints you. There will be times when you disagree with him. There will be times when he does not agree with your assessment. Remember what the shepherd's job is. He is not a cruise director or a head waiter. Although he will lead you by serving and pointing you to a joyful life. I want to share with you four things 
four issues that I see in the church. And the first four that I'm going to talk about, I see in the capital C church. I see it across church, churches everywhere. I talk to pastors. It's part of what I do. I have close friends that are pastors, and these things are showing up over and over and over. I shared these with our staff Thursday morning at the end of our retreat. It was a good retreat, by the way. The first one. There is enormous lack of biblical knowledge and application. There is an enormous lack of biblical knowledge and application. Biblical knowledge will not transform your life. If that's the case, the religion professors at Harvard would be the godliest men on the planet. In case you're wondering, they're not. Biblical knowledge will not change anything. Biblical application will change everything. There's enormous lack of biblical knowledge and application. It takes effort to learn. It takes effort to go through a Bible study. It takes effort. There's an enormous lack of biblical knowledge and application. Some of you may be hearing for the first time that the scripture is very clear that you should be under the authority of a pastor as a Christian. It is as plain as day. Second thing, second issue that I see in the church, emotionalism has defeated sacrifice. Emotionalism has defeated sacrifice. There's far too many of us bowing at the beast of what I feel. And we've thrown away the ability to sacrifice. Most people beyond sacrificing for their immediate family have no idea how to sacrifice for another human being. And if we're honest, most people don't even know how to do that. They don't even know how to do it within their family. We, we are bowing at the beast of emotionalism. Whatever I feel, whatever I think, then that must be the truth. Third thing, serve me rules the day. Serve me. Meet my need. The largest selling book of all time other than the Bible Sold more copies than any other book in the world. My first sentence is, it's not about me. Purpose-driven life. Serve me has ruled the day. There is nothing wrong with being served. We all need times in our life. We need times in our day to be served. But it cannot rule the day. The fourth thing, agree with me or else. Agree with me or else. Now, not everyone is these four things. There are still people, there are people who are applying the Bible to their life every day in this room. There's those of us that have not bowed to the beast of emotionalism. There are those of us that are sacrificing and serving, and those are, are, that, that, are that have the ability to disagree without ending the relationship. But we're in the minority. We're way in the minority. Now, those four things cross the board. I want to talk about some issues for Anthem Community Church. At the beginning of two, at the end of 2018, we moved from Pinecrest to here, and we were no longer a portable church. We went from being a portable church to being a fixed church. 
Now, the primary reason we did that was the few of us that were serving, by getting there early enough to set up and staying late enough to tear down, we got tired. And we said, we can't do this anymore. And so with a culture of serve me and not serve, we need to find a place where we don't have to do that every week. Making that move has impacted people in our family. They've mourned that. They miss the good old days. They miss the day of setting up. They miss that. Mourned it. And a lot of people spent 2019 mourning, I mean, 2019 mourning that. And that's okay. You should. If you made being in a portable church your identity at church, that's a problem. Our identity of first most is in Christ, and then it is to help people live the truth of Jesus in everyday life, whether we're portable, fixed, school, shopping center. Doesn't matter. That's just the means. But it's an issue. There's, there is this thing that whispers in some of our ears. It doesn't feel the same. And when we allow that to get a hold of us, we begin to bow at the beast of emotionalism. At the end of February, we had a major change in our staff. And it's hurt some and been confusing to a lot. And because of COVID, because COVID hit two weeks later, there wasn't a lot of time to mourn. And there wasn't a lot of time to process. And it's there. One of the things, I'll be just very transparent with you, one of the things that we did at our campfire the first night was we mourned as a staff. Because we haven't done that. And had time to do that. And then there's everything that is 2020. <laughs> you know, in five years, we're going to look back. When something goes wrong in 2025, you're going to say, that was so 2020, right? Because this year has been a mess. From the, from the COVID uh, to um, the political unrest, to the social unrest, to the, yeah, you get it. And then another heaviness that's on me as the shepherd is is some leadership mistakes. As a shepherd, sometimes you go left when you should go right. And sometimes you go forward when you should go backwards. And sometimes you stop when you should move forward. And sometimes you move forward when you should stop. And so there's been mistakes, and that's heavy. And when Jesus said, it's better to have a millstone, which is a really, really big rock, tied around your neck and thrown into the ocean than to lead one of these little ones astray. There's a lot of pressure. So, You put all of those things together. And I am tired. I'm weary. And it's a deep tiredness. Um, I plan to take a sabbatical this fall. Um, but I can't do that. Not with 2020. But I am tired. And it's a deep weariness. And it's not something that a week and all fixes. I'm going to ask Kevin to come up. Kevin's going to read some stuff for us.
And and before he reads, um, I'm hesitant to say these things because I know some of you are tired and you're weary and we're in this together. And I don't, I, I, str- I do not want to be a self-serving person. And I think you know that enough about me that that's not me. But I have to say these things. And these are some things that we need to think about. Um, because you need a pastor. And he needs to be healthy. And so I'm going to have Kevin read. He's going to mention some names. These men are professionals and they're studying stuff all across the country. This is not they had a phone call with a couple of friends and said, oh my goodness. Okay. These, these are seminary guys. The guys that we're reading is a seminary professor. And this is a thing that is we, we're seeing in our country that I don't believe is the result of COVID. I believe that COVID has risen these things to the top. Because those four things that I mentioned got nothing to do with COVID. I am not quitting. And today I'm not resigning. So don't let that get in the way of you hearing what he's about to read. Okay? But I do want you to hear what he has to read. The statistics are horrifying and the stories gut-wrenching. If something doesn't change, the American church will face unprecedented challenges in the next year and many local congregations will not survive. What's the tragedy? The growing realization that a significant percentage of pastors are considering leaving their churches. In July, Chuck Lawless sounded a warning in his post, six reasons why some pastors may resign soon after the COVID crisis. Others picked up on this theme. On August 31st, Thorn Rayner wrote, Please hear me clearly. The vast majority of pastors with whom our team communicates are saying they are considering quitting their churches. It's a trend I have not seen in my lifetime. Some are just weeks away from making an announcement. By the way, what they're saying is they're predicting about a third. And quitting is not quitting to go to another church. Quitting is quitting. Like, I'm not going to pastor anymore. It's too hard. Our pastors are in the middle of a battle that most believe they cannot win. Leading a church has always been difficult. Just read the New Testament. We have always known that pastors live in glass houses. Every decision is under a microscope. Pastors have never believed that they could please everyone. However, things have shifted. Pastors are being criticized, vilified, and abandoned. They know every decision will offend nearly half their congregation, many leaving to attend another church. Politics and social unrest have divided congregations, and social media has intensified the hostilities. And so the seminary professor, after his research, he has... uh, Hold on, Kevin, you're not done. Um, (laughs) He has just a a couple of paragraphs he'd like to say to fellow church members. Fellow church members, you and I need pastors. They are our shepherds, defenders, and teachers. But right now, our pastors need us. Remember, they are members of our churches too, and by all indications, this part of our body is suffering. I know this is just a little blog post, But my appeal is that we all decide to be different. Not only can our churches not survive losing our pastors, it is our spiritual duty to do everything we can to stop this from happening. We can do better. We must do better. And then he has a note to pastors. Dear pastor, please don't quit. We need you. I have spent over three decades in Christian ministry in the last decade training those called in the ministry. You have no greater cheerleader than me. I want to lean into this crisis and give a few bits of counsel. My prayer is that you receive these as words from a friend, not a critic. We need you around for a long time. One, give yourself a break. 
I know we act like you are our savior, but you aren't. Please don't hold yourself to this standard of perfection. No one knows what to do right now. We're all making things up. And two, take a break. I know there is too much to do. You can't do it all, but trying to check every box is killing you. And then he has three other things. Um, find a friend, which I am not friendless. I've been very, make friends is on the wall for a reason. So that's not me. Do something else. I have a hobby. I watched football all day yesterday. I'm going to watch football when I go home. Um, you know, revisit your calling. And that's certainly helpful things. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Like I said, I'm not quitting, but I am tired and I'm disappointed. I'm weary, but I'm not defeated. In fact, in some ways, I'm more excited and more pumped about some things than I've ever been. God is at work. He's at work in you. He's at work in me. He's at work in other congregations. He's at work in those pastors. The Almighty God is sitting on His throne. And what He wants us to do is to remain at our post. He wants to remain at our post. At some point, I'm going to do a series on Gideon. Gideon's my favorite person in the Bible outside of Jesus. And the reason I haven't done a series on Gideon is probably because it's too, um, it's probably a little too personal at this point. But the story of Gideon starts with Gideon in a cistern. He's hiding. He's hiding from the battle. And then he gets really brave and he goes and kills his dad's prized bull. That's just not something you would do. And then he gets into this time where he can't make a decision. And he needs all this clarity, so he keeps putting out a fleece and changing the rules and putting out a fleece and changing the rules. And then God leads him to the battle. The enemy's coming. And Gideon's feeling pretty good about it because there's thousands and thousands of warriors. Until God says, hey, Gideon, there's too many. What? you seen what we're fighting? There can't be too many yes. Whoever's scared needs to go home. So he stands up and says, if you're scared, go home. And thousands and thousands leave. And then God says, there's still too many. Take them to the river. And whoever drinks this way is out. He ends up with 300. And they go to fight this battle with lamps and horns, not real weapons. It's one of the things that I've said in my 30 years of ministry. I'd rather have 300 people committed than 10,000 that want to go home. Now, that does not mean I only want to pastor a church of 300. I'm pastor whoever God brings. Shepherds who will not lead in the hard things are worthless. Sheep that will not follow in the hard things are equally worthless. So what now? Well, I'm going to take a couple of weeks off. And next Sunday, Matt Olin's going to preach for us. He's going to preach his, he's going to preach his first ever big church, big boy sermon. I'm going to be here. I'm going to sit somewhere, listen to Matt preach. The following week, Mr. Joseph, who's sitting right here, is going to preach for us. He preached back for us in July, and he's going to, He's going to pick up and we're going to look at this little story about Jesus. These, all these people that Jesus had compassion for. And 
He took a Lunchable and he feeds a bunch of them. And Joseph's going to do a really good job with that. Lisa and, and Amelia and I, are, we're going to go see. <laughs> this gets me every time. We're going to take a, a week or so and go see Madison. So I'm going to have a Wednesday night Bible study for a while. And, and part of the heaviness on me is, I'm not sure you'll miss it because not many of you are watching it. Um, so no community homes for a couple of weeks but we're going to finish strong we're going to finish 2020 strong we're going to celebrate Christmas like we've never celebrated Christmas before I'm not talking about flying elephants in Circus Soleil y'all know the church that does that you can go to one of their 82 services. That'd be fine. <laughs> just, just give your offering here. <laughs> but we're going to celebrate Christmas, I think in a way that a lot of us have never celebrated Christmas before, after the year that 2020 is going to be. And then we're going to attack 2021. And we're going to attack it with abandon. And we're going to attack it with purpose in ways that we've never done before. In 2021, every person in our church is going to have the opportunity to be discipled one-on-one. -on -one, to have a one-on-one -on -one mentor to disciple you so that you will know the Bible. So that you can begin to apply the Bible. So that you won't bow to the beast of emotionalism. When we started Anthem... One of the things I used to say all the time was my vision for the church was for you to have the best marriage you can have and be the best parent you can be, be the best neighbor you can be. And it was never to build a building. And that has not changed. So if you need a vision of building a building, this is the wrong church. So we're going to attack and we're going to help people live the truth of Jesus in everyday life.